appreciated Carol's message just about uh, the fact that God is very practical, you know, and uh, that this, the things of the spirit are not so spiritual that they're not, they don't make sense to us in everyday life, you know. Um, if it's too hard for a child to understand, then it's probably too hard, period. It's probably not the Lord, you know. Um, we wanted to close really just honoring the marriage covenant. Um, is everybody in here married? No, we have, we have a couple single ladies. Um, um, but, yeah, I think that, I think that God wants to, um, just really honor what he made the marriage covenant to be in a lot of ways, which has been a personal journey of mine that has been very interesting <laughs> along the way. Um, but, you know, I thank God for just the marriage covenant because it's, it's such a, a chisel and a hammer, uh, and to just make us more like Jesus. I mean, in reality, that's really what it is. You know, it's a blessing. Um, and, you know, in my personal experience with my husband, you know, he's, you know, Dave is, is something, you know. <laughs> um, if you guys remember in the, the first message that I, I, earlier in the day when I said that there was a person who came and, and displayed who Jesus was to me, that was my husband, who's now years later. I mean, I was a kid at the time. Obviously, I didn't know I was going to marry him, but... Um, Dave had such a radical encounter with Jesus as a kid. Uh, I mean, he was, he was a completely different person. And um, he was everything that I was not on so many levels. And I remember just being like, what is this? Not like, who is this? What is this? <laughs> because he was so fearless and so not religious and so completely in love with Jesus and so pure. Um, he, he suffered, not, I mean, suffered, he, he was willing to give up anything to be closer to the Lord, which was something that was foreign to me, being a church kid. I mean, we try to do everything in secret that we could from our parents. You know what I mean? Like, it was just a completely, it was this, it was the reality of God in somebody my age, not somebody older, and it just revolutionized my life. Seeing Jesus alive in him changed my life. And it really caused me to realize my own bankruptcy. And he's a huge part of my testimony. Um, but I knew that Dave was strong. Um, in a lot of ways, he's like a, a bull. <laughs> like just, um, I didn't understand what that would mean like being his wife. Um, <laughs> and what that would mean like, God building my own character inside of my heart through him. Um, but before we go on, you know, I wanted to do this earlier and I completely forgot. I wanted to honor Jocelyn. Jocelyn, right? I'm sorry. But, you know, she's the mom of the house. You know what I mean? We just wanted to honor you and thank you for opening up your, the doors. And yeah, really thank you. I meant to do that earlier and it completely slipped my mind. But thank you. Really appreciate it. We honor you. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, if there's one thing that we have to understand, just at, at the structure and the base of what, of what marriage is, is it's first it's a covenant to Christ. That's who you cut a covenant first. And then it's a covenant to your husband. And um, it's a fine line throughout the years to kind of get those things mixed up sometimes, you know, to, to remember that um, my motivation and my ambition being a wife is to please Jesus first. And when I made those vows to my husband, whatever your vows said, we had some that we wrote on our own, and then we had some of the traditional ones, you know, um, sickness and health and poverty and riches, you know, whatever. You, you make all these, these vows, and, and in the moment, you mean it with everything that you are. But we have no idea what that, that looks like throughout the years, right? Dude, like... <laughs> and it's just... It's... It's been one of the greatest tools in my life to um, both conquer things that needed to be conquered in me and strengthen things that needed to be strengthened in me. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Really, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But um, so yeah, I honor my husband. He, he's, a, he's a good man. He loves Jesus. He's a real thing at home and, at the pulp, and behind the pulpit. Um, but yeah, I think that it's important for us. I mean, I, there's so many things we can, we can talk about when it comes to the marriage covenant. I, I felt like the, the word was honor, learning how to honor 
not just the marriage covenant, but our husbands specifically, the ones that God gave to you or for you single people, the ones that God will give to you one day. Um, so you can put this on the shelf until you get married. <laughs> but um, I think Psalm 1914 um, gives a beautiful picture of the honor that God desires for us to not just have towards him, but have towards our spouses. Um, and in certain ways, it's, it's easier to honor Jesus because the love he gives us is perfect. It's unconditional. He doesn't make mistakes. Even though sometimes, you know, it may take a while for you to get to the place where you understand that still it's, it's easier to honor somebody who's perfect. A lot easier. But the honor that Christ talks about and just requires of me biblically, um, it's not the easiest thing sometimes. It's, it's, yeah, okay, so let's read this out loud. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. Um, I think this is the perfect definition of honor. What, what, not just what we say, you know, but what we, what we are on the inside, you know. And so I had this, you know, I think that after we fail in certain areas, they almost become a comical picture for other people to see. So, <laughs> you know, years ago, early, it was like in my first year of being married, I was in my prayer closet and I was um, very much, um, I don't know if shocked would be the word, but just overwhelmed with the reality of what marriage was. You know, that initial just like, man, this is, this is work. This is, this is no joke. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, that, that initial like, you know, you know what I mean, right? Yeah, that jolt, right? And so uh, I'm in my prayer closet, and of course I'm praying for him because he's the one that needs to change. <laughs> and so I'm just, you know, just releasing all of it, and I'm like, Lord, you know, he's... You need to change this and you know you know this part of him and blah 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 and I'm going on and on and the Lord let me go on and on for God only knows how long and then I stopped and he said um he said you know when you're perfect we'll work on that and I was like oh <laughs> and then he said he said you know Danielle he said you're because he's just such a loving father right Hebrews 12 he corrects those he loves and I thank God for the correction of of Christ in my life and he told me he told me so very gently he said you know there's a difference between self-control and honor there's a difference he said you 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 have self-control you have the ability to control your tongue and that's that's good it's better than having no self-control it's good you know he he like a good father he acknowledged what I was good at, what I was well at, but he said, but you don't know how to honor him. You know how to control your tongue, but you don't know how to honor him. And I need to bring you to the place where you learn how to honor him because in dishonoring him, it's a dishonor to me because you made that covenant with me on March 23rd. And all of a sudden, my paradigm began to shift a little bit, and I, I had this insatiable hunger to find out what, equa what God equates godliness as when it comes to me being a woman, okay? Like, things are different now. I'm not in my parents' house. I can't just do what I want and stay up till all hours of the night praying. Like I did before. That was the life that I lived before. I, I got married, and it was beautiful, and it was wonderful, but it didn't last forever. So now I'm in a different season. And there's something that God's trying to get at inside of me. And um, we're in this constant conversation, you know, me and the Holy Spirit, in this constant conversation, like, Lord, I, I don't want to be taken advantage of. You know what I mean? I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to let him run me. I don't want to, you know, remember before I told you I'm passionate. So I don't want to, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, like there's just that natural, just this makes me very uncomfortable, you know, but I knew that there was something inside of me that had to change period. No matter what Dave was or what Dave did, whatever, there was something that God was trying to get at for his name's sake. And I needed to find that. So I began to search the script scriptures about what God equates as godliness. If you, if I want to be godly, and I remember early on, but I don't know if it was before I got married or right when I got married, I had a real close friend. And I remember her and I covenanting in prayer and just saying, whatever it costs to have a godly family will pay. I don't care what I have to lose. I don't care how many years I got to be locked up in a house pouring into my kids. I don't care. I, I'm not, I can win the whole world. If I lose my kids, I feel like I lose in the end. And so I was very intentional, very, very early on. Like I want 
my, I want a functional home according to scripture, and I want kids who love Jesus, period. Again, I don't care what I have to do to do that, Lord, and praying all these prayers as a young unmarried woman. And then throughout the years, realizing everything that you prayed for is available, but you don't always expect the way those answers have to come into reality in your own life, you know? <laughs> and so I began to search the scriptures, you know, reading, you know, First and Second Corinthians, reading First Peter, reading First Timothy, just all the references of what a woman is in Proverbs 31 and all these things. I mean, this woman seems pretty much impossible, like, <laughs> you know, like, but, but really believing like, no, no, he, if it wasn't attainable, he wouldn't put it in there. It's got to be attainable, you know? And so I had this, this pursuit and I was determined to find out why it doesn't work. You know, like why, why are there so many marriages that are failing and why are there so many kids that are just lost and that grew up in church and, you know, all the kids that I grew up in my church are not all of them, but a lot of them just, you know, strung out in the world, you know, on drugs and say, what, what is, what's missing here? Something, there's a gap between that's not making sense to me, you know, and all these questions would flow through my heart and, um, and, and so I'm going to, if you have a pen, you can write these down real quick. Um, these are the, the out of all the, the scriptures that I searched, you know, I, I wrote these things down because I feel like this is what characterized beauty in God's eyes when he made us, you know, the, the woman, you know, not the man, the woman. When he made us, this is what he equates as successful in his kingdom if we can demonstrate these things in our everyday life, okay? The first one is quiet. The second one is submissive. In my early days, I said the S word. <laughs> you know, and submission, to me, the best definition of submission is to yield. Just to make a conscious choice to yield to the leadership of both Jesus and your husband. Gentle, helping. In the book of Titus, it talks about her loving her husband and her children. Dedicated to good works. Respectful. Sensible. Pure. Workers at home. Help us, Jesus. Kind. Modest. Modest meaning... I put this definition here. It was just, it's really good. Manifesting humility and restraint. So we're not just talking about the way you dress. Modest in behavior, modest in speech, modest in thought. Receives instruction with humility. Temperate means good tempered. Faithful in all things. And this is the last one, which is patient, which means enduring without complaint. <laughs> and so I, you know, I want you to, you know, we're going to come back to this list a little bit towards the end, but these are the things that you can pretty much compile out of what God calls us to be and what he, um, what he, What's his grading scale, I guess you would say, according to how he made us. Now, if we are not faithful and loyal to, what, to the way God made us, there is a huge gap and everybody suffers. Everybody. Not just our husbands and our kids, but our children's children's children. Okay. And um, in Philippians 2, I'm going to read something to you real quick because I believe that um, it paints a, a beautiful picture of the power of um, honor that we could, you know, towards our husbands. I mean, we have to understand the mindset of why God, I mean, according, according to Ephesians um, 5, the reason why the marriage covenant exists is to be a reflection of Jesus and the church on the earth. This is the existing... People should look at our marriages and our homes and it should reflect the character and nature of Christ. It should. And that doesn't just happen because it just doesn't just happen one day. You know what I mean? Like with so many things going on around us, 
if we're not very much intentional to pursue Christ being the center of our homes and us looking a lot like him, then it, it's not going to happen, right? Okay, so Philippians 2, I'm going to read 1 through 8, okay? Therefore, is there, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equali equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Let's look at the first part, and then let's look at the last part, and then we'll go to the first part, okay? The reason why we are able to live a crucified life and to walk in a state of humility, honoring our husbands above ourself, and honoring the position that God has placed in him in per perfect security is because that's what Jesus did when he walked the earth. He put off. He made a choice, even though he was who he was, and he could have very easily changed the whole plan. He made a choice to put off, because of humility and because of love, to put off his power and his strength and his dignity to be able to pave a way. So if anybody understands what it's like to live in a state where, where the other person is not holding up to then their end of the bargain, but still being faithful and where you're at is Jesus. He understands that because it's what he did. And because it's what he did, he now paves the way for us to have the same, to draw that same strength from him. Like, Lord, I can do this because you did it first and you paved the way for me. And you, when you made woman, I mean, woman is a powerful force on the earth, powerful. And I believe the, the, the reason why there's such a huge attack on women and trying every idea under the sun to take her out of the home and put her somewhere else is because the house is not the house without her. <laughs> and this is, I mean, this is a woman's conference. So I'm focusing on the woman. You know what I mean, it's not to take away from the, the power of the man's position. But what I'm telling you is if we learn to find our place, the place that God made for us, and which he says is the best place for us to be. There's a sense of deep freedom that comes with that. So I can freely honor my husband because I cut a covenant with Jesus almost 10 years ago. And because I cut a covenant with Jesus and I'm pulling from the strength that he already passed through, this is, this is possible. This is a possible thing. This is an attainable goal, you know, and I think that that has to be our ambition because sometimes, especially as women, like Carol said earlier, you know, it's so easy for us to fall into this state of self-pity and feel like, you know, we're getting the short end of the stick and feel like, you know, well, you know, he gets to, he gets to do this and he's outside of the home and I'm stuck all day with his kids. We were saying that earlier, with his kids, not your kids, with his kids. You're stuck all day with his kids. <laughs> I mean, we all have these feelings and it's humanity. Like those feelings pass through everybody's mind. So don't feel bad and identify with those feelings because that's not who you are. Just make a choice. Like, no, he's empowered me and he's paved the way for me to walk in honor and humility. And I think where the gap comes inside of our minds is that we are under the impression that marriage is a contract and not a covenant. We're not a covenant people. We don't know what covenant means in our day and age. Like in our culture, no, I'll give 100% if you give 100%. But if you don't give one, if you give 50, then I'll give 50. It's a 50-50 relationship. I go to work this many hours a week, the whatever we agreed upon, that's how much money I bring home. That's the way our minds work. But American is not Jesus. So we have to come completely unreservedly accepting his way. And his way is covenant. 100%, 100% of the time, period. No questions asked. And that's not an easy place to be. <laughs> but the, I think the, the coolest thing that I've learned, you know, James Dobson had this quote. You guys heard of James Dobson? Yeah, he's powerful. He had this quote that I read years ago, 
And he said, in my experience with working with marriages, if you, and he was addressing the women, if you can lay down your life and give everything that you are for the first 10 years, you can guarantee the next 20. That's what he said, right? And I'm thinking, 10 years? That's a decade. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you're, I mean, I got married, I was almost 21. I was a kid. I mean, when you're 19, you're thinking 10 years, you know, when I'm 30? <laughs> it seems like such a far away, you know, distant, yeah. like not attainable thing. But you're forgetting that you signed up for, for forever on this life. You know what I mean? Like you will be, this is till you die, you know? And so, but I remember hearing that and it bringing this like deep, like sobriety of mind, like, Okay, look at that. The first 10 years, okay, so you get married and then, you know, you have kids and everything gets turned upside down and you feel like you don't know who you are anymore. And then, you know, you bring some pressure with the finances and then you bring some, you know, all these things where you feel like you, 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 like you know who you are, but in the same time you feel kind of bipolar. You know what I mean? Like you, <laughs> you know who you are, but then you think you know who you are and then you wake up and you're like, I don't know who I am. And then. <laughs> You know, like, I mean, I'm just keeping it real. This is how I felt. I, I felt so knocked off my block by the induction to, like, marriage. And then a, a year later, we had a baby, you know, not so, we had kids soon, you know. And then we had two really close together. And so I felt like everything was discombobulated. Everything that I, I thought that I knew, I didn't know. And it's not that I didn't know it. It's just that I knew it in a really small measure, right? I knew it in a really, really small measure. And now God was giving me all these opportunities and invitations to be able to be an imitator of Christ, which is what I wanted. You know, I just didn't expect it to come that way, you know. And so there's just a real humanity in this whole thing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm not a very, like, super spiritual, you know, you got to put, no, no, no. Look, it's rough. And some days, you know, you just don't want to do it. That's just a reality. Some days you wake up and you're like, you know, I just, I wish I could run away just for a couple of days and that'd be good and then I'll come back home you know that's really how you feel sometimes you know and in those moments like dear sister Carol said my place is the bathroom I hide I'm like I'll be back and I go you know in the bathroom and my, my daughter bless her heart she's seven years old and she, I have one girl and three boys and she's you know the mom in the house even though she's not the oldest and so when I, she sees me you know like just put my head down and just, you know, try to turn inward. <laughs> she takes the boys and she's like, mom needs a minute. Come on, let's go. <laughs> and she takes them to the other room. <laughs> it is, it's precious, you know. She's like, she has that look in her eyes. She's looking a little crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it would be great if it was just, you know, you get it just one time and then you're good. But it's just so not the case. And so I say all that to say that honoring your husband is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a choice to honor him because in honoring him, we honor Christ. And that's the covenant that we made, ultimately. You know, and so by what Jesus did, it empowers us, you know. So you think about that the next time you feel like you can't do this. No, you can do it because Jesus made a way for you to do it, okay? You got to talk yourself into that sometimes. And so that's the last part. Now we go to the first part, and, you know, he's reading all these things of one mind, making my joy complete by maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. You know, unity in a home and in marriage, it takes work. It doesn't just happen. It takes work. And, you know, I'm, my husband and I will be married for 10 years, but we've been together for a little bit longer. We've been together since we were 17. Um, but something changed over the last couple years where I feel like we entered into like a flow. You know, like I know the women who've been married here long enough, they're all smiling, they know what we're talking about. You, you come to this place where you just, it's not that, I mean, in one sense you are different, but in a lot of the ways you're not, you just come to this place where you, you're at rest with who Jesus is, with who he is, with who you are. It doesn't mean that God's not gonna change you. No, 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 no. But you come to this place where, you know, like, we made it past certain humps that seemed impossible to, to come past, but Jesus is still king, and he's still the center, and we're going we're gonna to do this, and we're going to do it right, and we're going to do it well, you know? And um, the, to, to be able to cultivate the unity of the Holy Spirit inside of your house means that everybody needs to be in their place. 
Husbands are the head. That's their place. It's the way God made them. And so we honor them as the head of our houses. We're not threatened by it. You know, the, the, the Trinity, I've heard the Trinity explained before as the family. You know, God's the Father, the perfect Father. Jesus is the Son, the perfect Son, and the Holy Spirit's kind of like the, the life, you know? Jesus is not trying to be the Father. The Father's not trying to be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not, not nobody's fighting for their place, but they're in perfect unity, and it, and it creates an atmosphere of perfect love. And we, that's what we have to do in our house. You know, it's, 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 you know, disgusting is a hard word, but it's harsh to see a woman fighting for a place that does not belong to her. It's lifeless, and it will kill you in the end because you, were, you don't have the shoulders to bear it. You were never made to, you never made for that place. That ship only steers straight if the right person is in their place. And it doesn't mean that any one character is more important than the other. It just means that everybody has to be in their place. You know, and that's something that's been turned upside down and twisted and in our culture now where there's just huge just fights, you know, like I had a young woman come up to me one time and she told me, Somebody told me that in the Bible it says that you got to submit to your husband. <laughs> and she's like, I don't believe Jesus would say that. <laughs> and she had only been saved for like a month, you know. So I was like, well, why don't you sit down? You know, <laughs> we'll talk. You know, now, now mind you, she's only been saved for a month. So her, I mean, she had had this horrible background. Her idea of men were just, was just all, disco just not godly. You know, she, did, she had never seen what a godly man was, didn't have a father, didn't have a, nothing, just been abused. It was just the whole nine. And that's why she felt that way, obviously. But there's a lot of women who, feel, who really do feel that way because you see it alive in their life. You know, like, remember right as a young wife, you know, people in, in, their, in their kindness trying to give me all kinds of tidbits of wisdom, you know, like, oh, well, you know, the husband's the head, but you're the neck. That controls what direction the head goes, you know? I'd be like, Okay, right. And my, this is my immediate response. Did it work for you? Because if you're miserable and married, then I'm really not trying to hear what you got to say. You know what I mean? Like, if you hate your husband and, you know, <laughs> I mean, no, I'm serious. But they were trying to help me as a young woman, you know. And, you know, I would take and I'd be like, okay, thanks, you know. And just, no, I'm not letting that stuff get into my heart because that's not right. That's not godly. That's not the Bible, you know? That's not right. And, and women give me um, ideas of how to change my husband's point of view and how to calm him down, to not be so crazy. You know what I mean? And so, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call him, like, you know, oh, he's very strong-willed. You know, you have to make sure that you, you know, speak your mind in the beginning because you don't want to be taken advantage of, you know? <laughs> And, you know, I believe that their, heart, their hearts were good, but they're speaking out of a place of, of wounds, you know? Like, your wounds are speaking. You're not speaking by the Spirit. You're speaking from an experience that you had that God has to deal with, you know? And so I'm not here to, dis, you know, to dishonor people in my life who have, who have given me advice, but the fruit is the proof, you know? Like, when I see a woman who, it glows out of their life, you know, like, like light. A woman who's perfectly content in her place, who loves her husband, who lays down her life for her children, who, you know, when I see people who have older children that love Jesus and, you know, I just want to follow them around with like a notebook. Like, <laughs> you know, like, tell me, like, what did you, you know, and I know you got to hear the Lord, but I want, you want wisdom. Like, what did you do that worked? Because it's so hard to find. It's very hard to find a woman that looks like this. It's hard to find them. A lot of times it's the complete opposite. They're bitter, they're, they're lonely, they're depressed, they're on drugs, they're, they're, they're disconnected from the body, they're insecure, they're, they don't know who they are. You know, there's constant friction between their husbands and their children. It's just, it's all jacked up, you know? And then I don't say that in judgment, but I say, like, that scares me. That puts a fear inside of my heart. Like, I got one chance to do this and I want to do it well. And I don't want to take for granted that it's just going to all work itself out one day. Like, no, Jesus is very intentional on the direction he's given us. He's very specific on how we are to speak, on the spirits that we're to cultivate as women. And I'm telling you, like, I resisted this for a long time. You know, like, I resisted it because it didn't make sense. It seemed like weakness. It seemed like, um, 
Like you were going to get stepped all over. It seemed like a doormat. It didn't seem like it would be something that would equate to anything at the end of the day, you know? Like it didn't seem like it was of much value, you know? And I knew my husband was strong, you know? And not that I tried to be stronger, but I, I needed to make sure that I, I stayed heard, you know? Like even if it wasn't with my mouth, you know? Because sometimes, I mean, I've, there's a quote where like, I don't know how much percent of body language is communicates more than your mouth. I don't know what it is, but everything communicates something. Your eyes, your, your demeanor, your body language, your, you know, you know, <laughs> that one. You know, like it's, it's a reflection. It reflects something, you know, and I'm not saying that to make you feel bad, but I'm saying that honor is a position of the heart. It's a choice. And so I, I choose to honor my husband according to what God is making him, the same way I want him to honor me for all the mistakes that I make a hundred times a day. You know, like it's always easier to look, you know, at, you know, Ephesians 6. I'm gonna, let me go, I mean, Ephesians 5, I'm sorry. And, and you know, verses 22, you know, and, and, and 24, it talks about the women, you know. But it's easy just to kind of, you know, skip over 20 through and, and just start from 25, you know. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. You know, <laughs> you know, and so it's easy to see those things and then look at him and say, well, he's not loving me like Christ loved the church, so I'm not going to submit to him. I'm not going to yield to that because that's not what God would want me to do. You know, like I had a woman say one time, we were counseling this couple who was just going through some turmoil, some hardships, and um, she you know, her husband, it wasn't anything, like, it wasn't adulterous or anything, but he, he had fallen to some kind of sin, and, you know, she was really hurt, and, you know, try to comfort her, you know, but at the same time, God's a covenant-keeping God, you know, and it's as hard as it was, you know, I could, I could tell you what my side of the mind would say, because it's hard to see you in this state of pain. Leave him. You deserve better, you know? Like, that'd be easy for me to say just out of, um, you know, you see your friend hurting and you know that, you know, her husband's not who he needs to be. And it's easy for my, my emotions to just say, just, you know, you'll be better off without him, you know. And then find scripture to justify, you know, well, God, and this other, so I'm listening to her and I'm like, oh, God, give me, you know, give me wisdom. And I want to be loyal to truth, but at the same time, you know, we need to be compassionate and I want to identify with her suffering and and then this woman tells her, you know, well, you know, God, what, God doesn't want to see you not happy. You know, and I looked and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, because I'm thinking, who said marriage was about you being happy? Who said that? That is not in the Bible, you know? <laughs> you know, and I, like this, you know, you ever feel like this? Yeah, something just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, this is what we really believe. That this marriage covenant is about me being happy, my personal happiness at the end of the day. This is what this is about. No, that has nothing to do with it. Is it a benefit if you do it right? Absolutely. But that's not what it's about. It's, it's a reflection on the earth of what Jesus is to us. That's what it is. That's what it's supposed to be. Nobody said anything about you being happy or you being in a constant state of ecstasy because you married your romance. You know, some, you know, this is why I have a big beef with romantic comedies. I really do. I have something in it just, you know, because <laughs> it's not real. It's not real, you know. <laughs> you know, and I have these single women, and they're like, oh, you know, I saw this movie. And, and I'm looking like, girl, look, you're going to have three kids. And, you know, like, that's just, it doesn't exist. It's not real. <laughs> they show you like six months into your relationship and then they end the movie, you know? And you're like, oh, like, you know? No, and then your husband comes in and you're looking at him like, you do not treat me right. <laughs> you know? You know, and it's comical, but it's true. Like this, it's this false picture of love, you know, that at the end of the day, love is just self-serving. I'm in this and I got married because I wanted to be happy and I didn't want it to be lonely and I wanted to have kids and I wanted to share life with somebody, which are all, they're not bad reasons. Those are good. Those are part of the reasons why you get married. I'm not trying to take away of the beauty of satisfaction, but I, I believe in the context, the context of honor, which is what God has 
just burned in me, and I pray that he continues to do so, is this is not about you being happy at the end of the day. This is about you honoring my way and in turn being a reflection to everybody else who looks from the outside in, right? And that's why he addresses the church. I, I don't even know where it's at. We need Jeff and Dave here because they're good with, you know, verses and stuff. But when he says somebody who's, if you can't run your own house, how are you going to run the church? Why is that? Because who you are is who you are at home. That's who you want. You know, you want to find out who you really are, see who you are at the house when no one else is looking. And there's this quote here by, by um, Oswald Chambers that says, the true test of a person's spiritual life and character is not what he does in the extraordinary moments of life, but what he does during the ordinary times when there is nothing tremendous or exciting happening. A person's worth is revealed in his attitude toward the ordinary things of life when he is not under the spotlight. You know, and that's just a beautiful picture of what it means to cultivate a, a heart of honor, you know? And so how do we do that practically? You find a way. That's how. I wish there was a way, there was a recipe that I can tell you, if you do these four things, your heart will go into honor. But it's just not. Everybody husband, everybody's husband's different. Your lives are different. Your callings are different. Your kids are different. But it's just a constant state to understand that this is the man that God has put in my life to make me more like him. And I'm going to honor and love him with all my heart because this is what God's called me to do. And when you learn how to honor, all of a sudden, this huge um, tree of like what you value just springs up inside of your heart like a well. You know, like all of a sudden, the meetings, you know, that we feel like we were getting taken, like ripped off on that we can't go to, all of a sudden, it just doesn't mean that much anymore. You know, like I want to honor Jesus. And the lot he's giving me right now is to love that man and help him get to where God's called him and be who he's called to be. By me doing that, I glorify Jesus to its max, yeah. period. You know, more than any sermon or, you know, whatever you speak, it doesn't matter. Like, I want to honor my husband because I know that he's going places in the kingdom and Jesus needs him. And I know that by me helping him, I fulfill the highest call of God in my life. And then by me building a heritage in my children and teaching them and passing down everything. We're not raising kids. We're building a heritage that's going to last for, you know, until Jesus comes back. So by us passing those truths down and living it out, our daughters get to see what a Proverbs 31 woman is. And our sons get to see what to look for in wives. And our, it's, a, it's a real picture, you know. And that's why if it's not alive in the house, it's not alive. It's just a fact that we know. And so this has been my biggest heart. Like, this is like my, my subject, you know what I mean? Like, you know how you have your things? Like, this is my thing, you know? <laughs> because it's so, it was so crippling to me when I didn't know and I lived in ignorance. But once I began to pursue it and realize that the heart of God is fulfilled to its max when we're in the perfect place that he's made us, all of a sudden this huge idea, like liberty came. It wasn't hard to submit. It wasn't hard to yield. It wasn't hard to love him when he came home in a bad mood or when I saw the humanity of who he was because they are humans. You know what I mean? Like that became easy because I made room for Jesus to come through and love through you. You know what I mean? And so I, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing to honor him. You know, and, and I, I, I want to close with just the, the, the picture of sowing and reaping because I heard an, an older woman, she had been married for, I don't know, like, 30, 40 years, maybe, maybe about 40 years. And she was asked, she was teaching us um, about, you know, marriage at its best, you know, and she was just giving us nuggets of truth. And she said, marriage is the law of sowing and reaping. That's what it is. She's like, you want love and honor and respect and dignity, you got to sow it. You got to sow it, period. She's like, so just make up in your mind every morning that I'm going to sow and I'm going to sow. And then when she was saying that, I heard the got to invest the first 10 years to guarantee the next 20, right? That's what I heard. I was like, okay, you know, like I'm, I'm going to sow. I'm going to sow, I'm going to sow, and I'm going to sow, and then I'm going to make a mistake because I know I'm going to make a mistake, and then I'm going to repent, and I'm going to keep sowing. <laughs> and, and, you know, something changes, you know. It's the dynamics of, of your relationship, the way your husband relates to you changes, the way, because you sow, you know, and you sow it. God can back up what he made. He can't back up your feudal wisdom, but he can back up the blueprint that he's given us in the Bible. He can back that up every single time, you know? So it's like when something's off, we got to go back to the blueprint. Let's check. 
Let's make sure we're lining up with what God's called us to do here. You know what I mean? Something's off, so okay, we need to go back to the blueprint. Because at the end of the day, I want Jesus to get maximum glory. Right? And so for him to get maximum glory, it has to be done his way. <laughs> no other way. It's got to be done his way. You know, and so it's, you know, just as a word of encouragement to you ladies, you know, honor the man God has given you because he gave him to you. You know, like he gave him to you for a, a higher purpose than our minds can sometimes understand. You know, and if you have a hard time honoring him, I believe that God can give you love that will empower that. You know, like I can love my husband the way I want to, or I can ask God to fill me with love for the way you see him. You know, like let me see what you see when you see him. And let that be my ambition and what I flow out of to love him and to, you know, cook for him and to bless him and to clean, clean, you know what I mean? Like all those just mundane things, all of a sudden it's, it's charged with this deep sense of energy of you want to, like I want to honor him. And eat. on a side note, they are the first calling and then your children, you know? And that's a hard, you know, we can very easily hide in our kids. They love us unconditionally. It's easier to love them than it is to love your husband sometimes, you know? Yeah. It, it's easier to love them because they, you know, they think we're as good as it gets, you know? <laughs> you know, and I know you go through pockets where it's not so easy and stuff, you know, but it's very easy when you have a lot of kids, you know, to just kind of park there and this is my priority now, you're going to have to figure it out yourself. You know what I mean? Like, I have all this going on, babe, you know, you got to, you know, like, and I'm, in certain ways, you know, you got to learn to adjust. Everybody has to learn to adjust, but he's still your primary calling in life. If you look at the scripture, this is the primary call. You're called to be a helper because one day your children are going to grow up and leave and then you're going to be with him all over again, back to square one, you know, seriously. And you see a lot of, you know, I see it firsthand, you know, they almost go into shock when their kids are gone because, and a lot of them who neglected their marriages for all these years, you know, by just revolving everything around the children are now left with a whole lot of nothing. And now their nest is empty and they're just, you know, now I'm stuck with you, you know, <laughs> Seriously, and there's like this, you know, and, and it's hard to, to adjust back to the place where it's just you and him. I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like without the kids living in our house, you know? Like, but there's something that needs to be built and cultivated in you, and it's got to be very much intentional, you know, on building him as the head and making him feel that I'm behind you 110%. You know, success or failure, I'm with you, period. You know, no matter, I know you're going to make mistakes. I know you're not perfect, and that doesn't matter to me. I, I, I honor you for who God's made you to be, and we're in this together, period. I don't care what it looks like. I, I signed the contract 10 years ago, and we're in it. You know, like, we're in it. No, it doesn't matter what life looks like. You know, we're in this together for the long haul, and there's, God can empower you to do that. You don't have to just muster up the strength to love him. Like, no, God can take the love that's in his heart for your husband and put it in you like a seed, you know, like in seed form, and then you water it, and you cultivate it, and you till it, and you give it sunshine, and, you know, you cultivate that, and it will turn into a beautiful tree. I guarantee it, because his way works, you know, so just be encouraged, you know, let's, let's stand up. Come on, let's pray. You know, I know that the conference was, you know, geared towards women, but we didn't, I really don't think that you can, or at least I didn't, it, I didn't understand all that, you know, the concept of honor and, and, and being a hidden woman and what that looks like. And, you know, I didn't understand what that meant until I understood the cross and, you know, the dynamics of the world influencing my mind and, you know, cult, learning how to cultivate a spirit of intimacy in my house. You know, you can't really understand the value of loving your husband the way God calls us to um, unless you understand those other things first, you know. So, you know, that's why we came from that angle. It's why we set things up the way that we did, you know, where I want you to go away with asking God what you can do, not just in your own life, but what you can do in your husband's life. You know, this is not so much your children, even though that's important, you know, but in your husband specifically, I believe that there's things that God needs to break off. I believe that there's wrong ways of thinking, you know, that need to be tweaked inside of our minds, inside of our hearts, 
value systems that are that are wrong you know and I'm not saying that in judgment I'm saying is an invitation for freedom because when you know where the spirit of is there's liberty and um, God wants to give us sound minds so that we can live in a place of freedom knowing who we are and not fighting to be anything else you know because that's where we find the greatest rest you know so let's just let's just pray I don't I'd rather pray for you. So do we have any music that we can put on? Yeah, could we, could we put some soft music on? Could we rather just pray for you? You know, what we had envisioned inside of our heart is, you know, you guys just pray. We, we want to just come around and lay hands on you and just, you don't move. You stay where you're at. You know, we just want to, whatever the Lord says, and, you know, honor that. And just on, is there anybody here who's been married for over 15, 20 years? Yeah? Wonderful. Let's just bless their marriage is real quick. Okay, let's do that first. <laughs> Jesus, I thank you for the, the beautiful marriage covenant, Jesus. And as young women, we honor the, the older women in our lives, Jesus. We honor their journey and what you've brought them through. We honor the, the, the ability to be able to show us younger women, like you say in the book of Titus, to train us and teach us how to love our husbands and love our children. Jesus, we honor these women publicly and before you. We pray that you would strengthen them and their latter days would be greater um, than their former Jesus. We pray for an increase of love and intimacy in their marriages and in their communication with their husbands. We bless their homes and their children in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So let's just, let's just seek the Lord. You know, I want you to think about that list, you know, that I gave you. If there's anything specific that, that you want prayer for, you know, you know, please let us know. But other than that, we're just going to pray for, you know, whatever the Lord, whatever the Lord puts on our heart, but just, you know, you and Jesus right now. Thank you, Jesus.